Hello everybody, this is Dr. Novak again, and in this video I'm going to talk about fertilization, or fertilizing your aquarium plants. But uh, now since the tank is reached over the three month, 90 day period, just recently, the other day in fact, I finally cleaned the big uh, filter. This guy here, the ADA 2400. Uh, it was dirty, okay, the biggest hassle with the whole thing is basically the weight. But other than that, uh, it fared pretty good. And I did want to show you something right here, look at this. That little plant you see there, that plant is growing from the crypt that's uh, on your right hand side. And that's from one of the root systems stretching out. So for 90 days that plant is basically developing its root system. And what I did is I added some new moss and I glued it onto the wood. Now I like wood because of the capillary action that wood gives you compared to uh, that of stone. A lot of stones won't have capillary action, but wood does. So, because of that, I actually have went and glued some terrarium plants on top of the wood that's poking out of the aquarium. And I'm going to see how that works. I glued it on so it wouldn't come off, just little dabs of glue. We'll, we'll see how this progresses on that wood. It's nice and moist. The nutrients from the aquarium should be enough to have this grow and of course these plants I just bought from Petco and the moss I also bought from Petco and I just glued little dab of glue for the moss it will take at least three to four months for that moss to catch on because if you see like Keith here the moss that's here it's finally growing on the wood and it looks pretty good. And this was moss I just bought at Petco. Nothing special. You're probably wondering why I buy a lot of stuff at Petco. I buy it because of the new people coming into the hobby. That may be the only aquarium store or pet store that they have available to them. They may not have a, a lot of pet stores available to them. So... That's why I try to get a lot of my stuff at PetSmart or Petco, just to show everybody that, yes, you can have a planted aquarium. Be patient when they get their plants in. Uh, I also bought, uh, like the lotus here, for example, um, from Krabby Patties here in Florida. Very nice mom-and-pop shop, and they carry these lotus $5 a piece. How can you beat that? Look at that. Beautiful, isn't it? And I, like I told you in my last video, don't just buy one lotus. Buy two, three, four of a lotus and put all the bulbs together. And you're going to get a real big, huge lotus like this. Look at that. And that's the same way with this one over here. You can see underneath the plant how the lotus is filling in. And that's what you want. You want a real nice, big show plant like the lotus have. And, of course, the pennywort, that was only one plant. And look at that. Unbelievable for one plant. And I that's not even 90 days old. But look at that. And all I do is keep cutting cuttings from it and buried it into the substrate. And look how it grows. Just growing like crazy. If you watched my last video about the light, uh... I, I believe that the light has a lot to do with it, along with me. I do use CO2, but like I have said in many of my videos, no, I do not bring my CO2 up to the levels that a lot of planted aquarium hobbyists recommend. I just add enough more than what the tank would originally have, and the plants may grow a little slower, but you know what? That's okay with me. I'm in no rush to have everything grow, but... 
the leaves to the lotus that you see here, they're at least five to six inches long already. And they've been in there, I would say, 60 days or less. But but I thought that was pretty interesting. Already the, the crypt is sending out runners into the substrate. Look at that. Everything is doing great. The fish are extremely colorful. I'll try to get a good picture of these fish. These are your typical, you know, red tetras, nothing, nothing to write home about. Most people, if they saw them at a pet smart or pet cold, probably would buy them if they're beginners, but most people wouldn't buy them because they're pretty drab looking fish in the, their aquarium. But they really color up and they get about um, almost two inches. But when you see them when they're full grown, they're really eye popping. Uh, fish well worth it. And they school. Very good schooling fish. They're one of those schooling fish that, uh, that stick, stick together. But they are fin nippers. Okay, just like the tiger barbs are. So that's something to consider. But if you want a species tank, they really look good and they start coloring up beyond what you're ever going to see at the at your aquarium store so it's well worth spending the money and usually these are their cheaper schooling fish believe it or not you can buy these for about two dollars and thirty cents to two dollars and fifty cents where if you want a rummy nose a rummy nose will cost you about five dollars per fish so you can buy at least two of these per one rummy nose but i thought i would show you the new moss that i got once again this is just bought at a Petco, and I do this on purpose without mail order. Not that I'm against or don't advocate mail order, but this is just something I want to show people because, you know, the beginner hobbyist, if you're younger, you don't have the money, or, or if you are younger and you're not on the Internet, and this is something that anyone can go with their parents or just their small income and wind up going to these aquarium stores and picking up some nice plants okay you're not going to pick up your real rare plants that are being sold but uh you know enough to make a tank like this you know that's all uh, that's all i'm saying you, you, it's good enough for me uh i know it doesn't have a, elaborate plants a lot of these plants are considered to be hardy plants just like the up here this is considered to be a terrarium plant and you buy it at Petco and I will show you what they are the moss and everything and it seems to work out good the moss is going to take a while to take because it was in a package but it, it will take because all the moss I have in there in my aquarium was bought at Petco every bit of it so it's done good it's a slow grower the fish are doing great in the aquarium and the only thing that has a little bit of algae on it if you want to call it that is the Anubias but for me Anubias always seem to get algae on them as you can see on the on the leaves but uh, not enough to kill the plant or anything else it's just that that's the way they are so the they're believe it or not there there is another Anubias there underneath the lotus and so what I'm going to talk about is how to actually put fertilizers into your aquarium so you don't wind up with problems and that's something I think that uh, that everybody should learn what to do and how to inoculate your aquarium with fertilizer so you don't end up with problems. I mean, because if you look right here at this wood, this wood's right underneath the light, and it's not all full of algae and everything else that's causing a big problem. And that's what you want. But if you add too much fertilizer, you're going to add too much nutrients all at once, and then you're going to wind up with problems. So, well, let's get into 
not looking at the aquarium and start getting into what exactly I do and how you can actually get a nice looking aquarium. You don't have to go all elaborate with uh, with very expensive plants unless you want. That's, that's totally up to you. I'm not telling you what to do. But um, as you see, my plants are simple. It's just, it's, you know, I just consider it to be a, a simple freshwater aquarium. That's what I consider it to be. It's been very successful, and if this is the first time you're tuning in, this aquarium does use a 4-inch plenum, and here it is. It is uh, operated by a Tetra pump, which is right here. That is the smallest Tetra pump you can buy. Uh, I think it's 0 to 10 gallons or 5 to 10 gallons. They're very small. You don't need a lot. And in the back there, you can see how I covered up the bubbler with using a uh, wood. So it's not really that loud. It's, it's something that this is in my office, so I don't worry about it. But to be honest with you, for being over 90 days old, and I have just changed the filtration on it, clean the canister filter. Hey, it, this is low maintenance. It's almost zero maintenance. Think about it. If if I have to clean the canister filter uh, once every 90 days, I mean, that, that that's... I'm not going to complain about that. I don't know. if. But uh, the reason, and there's a reason behind all this, is that... It's the balance of the aquarium and the bacteria along with the filter. There's a balancing act, and that's what you're trying to achieve with your aquarium. This balancing act. And you have to have your substrate, as we can see here, balanced with the aquarium itself. And to bring nutrients down into the substrate so your plants can keep growing and, and multiplying. And it's just no different than, look at this. This plant, look at this, this mottled sore. It's constantly bringing up new leaves from the center. Constantly doing that. It's, it's a beautiful plant. Um, I'm trying to think. I think I bought that at Petco. It was just one of those things you got to constantly go to Petco and keep looking. I think that is a Petco plant, and so are the swords that you see over here. These swords, are, they're all Petco. There's three of them. Those are Amazon swords, and they were all bought at Petco. And they had just gotten them in, so they, they were in very good shape, very, very good condition. And when they get big, they'll fill in that whole corner there. Now, there is uh, a few things I did want to talk about that, as hobbyists, we, are, we look at. And one thing people say, well, how do you vacuum the substrate? How do you vacuum the substrate? And I'm going to get into that. Okay, one thing I'm going to get into is when you have an aquarium like this, how do you vacuum the substrate? A lot of people say, how do you do it? Um, because you're supposed to vacuum the substrate. And how would you do it with all these plants? Think about it. How could you? Well, in truth and reality, you don't. Because what you have here is you have the fish poop falling down into the substrate. You're using a plenum, so you have live bacteria. This is called organic matter. And I have said it in my other videos. This organic matter is going to break down into ammonia and nitrites and nitrates. But because you are using a plenum, it helps move the water from the water column here, move it slowly into this substrate. Okay, we know that is a fact. Whether it works through diffusion, convection, percolation, osmosis, but we know it is moving because we have a plenum that's over an inch high 
down at the bottom of this, where water is constantly being pumped out very slowly. It's being removed and being displaced by water that's full of nutrients. So we know that. That's a, that's a fact. That's a gimme. The, the, the whole thing, how it works, is it moves very slowly. In the old days, when we had under gravel filters and used them, we would pump as much water as you could through the filter because we're trying to develop aerobic bacteria. Well, through studies that I have done and through research and lab research, I found out that there's other bacteria we really want to colonize besides just the aerobic bacteria. We can have aerobic bacteria, but after that we want to create anoxic conditions. And anoxic conditions means low levels of oxygen at uh, 2 parts per million to 0.5 parts per million of oxygen. And that's what we're trying to create. We are not trying to create anaerobic conditions. We're trying to create anoxic conditions. And if you do not use a bubbler, that's okay. You will still create anoxic conditions. But through what I've experimented with and researched on, if we can move the water slowly and displace that water, just about an inch here, avoid an inch. If we could displace that water, just it doesn't have to be a lot. That's why I've explained to you in past videos. It just has to be enough so you're moving that water out of there very slowly, and now you have what's in here going into here very slowly. Remember, this is 36 inches by 24 inches deep. And I have a little bitty bubbler on there that's designed for uh, a betta bowl, which I show you in my other videos. It's probably a 3H tubing, 6 inches long, and just being bubbled with a very weak bubbler. So this goes to show you, you don't have to move water very quickly through a plenum. But the thing of it is, and here's the good news, which I have found out, that the fish waste and all, all lands on top, which we all know, that's what we try to get. But the trouble is, as it, as it breaks down, right, it now carries through the substrate. It's a fertilizer. Okay? It does two things. Okay? One, it feeds bacteria that's in here. Bacteria utilize that ammonia. Two, that ammonia is needed by your plants. All plants look for ammonia first before they look for nitrates. Okay, so now you're allowing that ammonia being broken down for your plants. And look at it like I showed you over here. Already the roots are sending out runners on the crypt. And the other crypt over here is recovering. That's the one I got from the 20-gallon uh, aquarium. It's recovering. Uh, in the 20-gallon aquarium, in fact, because of the root system spread out over 12, 13 inches, I have plants that are grown on the other side of the aquarium that are crypt because the plenum is allowing nutrients to come in in all spots. So now the roots are able to spread out and take those nutrients and actually develop a new plant, just like you see over here. I did not plant that over here. That just came about from the root system from that particular crypt. And in, in a while, that crypt's going to start growing better because it has developed its root system. And the same way with this one that went in the shot, it will now have to redevelop a lot of the roots that, when I pulled it out, broke and stuff. And once that develops, it will probably send out runners and make more crypts. And remember, remember what I told you. You get, you see no crypt rot. And the reason you don't see crypt rot, which we all know that all of a sudden the, the leaves of the crypt just start, because nitrates, if you have a lot of nitrates, the crypt takes in nitrates, these crypts do, but they don't know how to utilize it. Remember? I said that. They, they, they through centuries and centuries and or thousands and thousands of years the plant's been around, it's never learned how to break down the nitrates back into ammonia. So crypts only can use ammonia. They don't use nitrates as a food source. 
what happens is when you feed your aquarium nitrates, like with your fertilizers, the first thing that's going to get affected is your crypts. Your crypts are going to start rotting because they're taking in that nitrate and they don't know how to break it back down into ammonia, is which what they need. So that stays in the cells and it eventually you get what is called crypt rot and the plant eventually starts melting on you. And I would say 85% of the time when people have crypt rot, I check out their aquariums and do tests. Nitrates are, are higher than 15 parts per million. It's just too high. So if you can keep Excuse me, if you keep your nitrates low, your crypts will actually do better, believe it or not, because they do first look for ammonia. But in the overall scheme of the aquarium, when we look at it, we not only does that fish waste help bring fertilizer into aquarium, that's why that's why I've never advocated the use of dirt. Why have dirt? I have over 50 fish in here. Okay. They're creating a lot of, you know, poop. But that's good. It goes into the substrate. It breaks down. It goes through and feeds what little root plants you have. But look, for a new plant, you got a root way over here already. And I know this one's already starting to spread out. But... These roots are starting to spread out because if a plant finds a food source, it will start spreading its roots out and then make what they call root hair, hairs and proliferation. Okay, And that means it's working harder to clean your aquarium and also to pick up what food is in your substrate. So that's why I explained to you the substrate will never really die it never will have to be changed because it doesn't get tired out. It's a starter where you get your, I'm using Fluvo, but you can use whatever you want. It doesn't matter. In fact, in my other aquarium, like I said, I only use gravel with zero in it. It's got nothing. It's inert. It, 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 that benefits the plant. And yet my crypt, they're growing all over the bottom, big, vast, root system and that is because nutrients are getting to the root system so and then you got the fish waste also going in there so that is helping make that plant grow and prosper in your aquarium so that's exactly what is happening here these plants are, are doing real good only because they're seeing a lot of nutrients that they can pick up because it's constantly bringing nutrients through the substrate. This is how a natural system works. Okay, if you go to a pond, lake, stream, this is how they work. Water is constantly moving in and out of the substrate. Constantly. Okay, so this is the intersection of topography right here. And from here... Water moves in and out of the substrate because remember I explained to you that this substrate is charged now and this has a positive charge to collect negatively charged ions to move them into the substrate. Whether you have a slow moving plenum or you don't have a slow moving plenum, it works all the same way. Like I've said before, I didn't invent the under gravel filter. All I did is find out how to use it correctly because as time went on, the undergravel filters were used correctly, but manufacturers start changing their thought on them and start making one-inch lift tubes and, and bringing more water and more water and more water into the substrate faster and faster to keep the oxygen levels very, very high because they didn't want the oxygen levels to drop to two parts per million or lower because then the aerobic bacteria that we utilize, nitrosomatis, it won't work anymore. Oxygen levels get too low. But at the same time, what they did is they hindered plant growth because water was moving too fast and they got rid of a valuable bacteria that we need 
And that, of course, was the anaerobic heterotrophic vacutata bacteria. That bacteria went to the wayside. It was mainly uh, catering to the aerobic bacteria, which we know is the nitrogen cycle. But it, it's, it's nice to think that you can have a nitrogen cycle, right? And everything gets utilized. So when one bacteria makes a waste of nitrites, it gets used up. Then another bacteria uses the nitrites and makes nitrates. It gets used up. And then another bacteria uses the nitrates and uses the phosphates as a food source or oxygen source and turns it into nitrogen gas. That's how a natural system works. That's what we need to replicate inside a closed system. And years ago, people didn't know how to do it. They, they just did not understand the science behind it. Of course, if you're watching my channel, you are better understanding the science of what is happening and why it's happening. And these are the facts. So how do we get nutrients because eventually these plants are using the iron magnesium they're, they're they're using all the nutrients in the water how do we get to get the nutrients back into the aquarium without overdosing it or bringing down your tds or crashing the tank are causing algae problems. That's one big problem I always hear. People say, uh, I'm using fertilizers and now my tank is full of algae. And I have to explain to them that when you use fertilizers, it needs very little fertilizer every single day. It's because a lot of your nutrients oxidize and they become useless to the plants once they oxidize. So a lot of your nutrients oxidize. And for, since we're trying to keep a high oxygen environment, it doesn't take long for them to oxidize and they become so when they become useless, the plant can't use it. There are products out there, doesn't matter what product you use for a fertilizer, it doesn't matter to me anyhow, but uh, they will explain to you how much to use, Let, let's say like this uh, Seachem product, okay, that I use, sea chem. you can use anything you want, the aquarium co-ops, fertilizer, you can use anything you want, Here's, but these get you in trouble, or uh, I even use this, Flourish Iron, and this is for, this has iron in it, it's good for ponds, I use it for ponds, because Iron, believe it or not, is, a, is very critical in starting bacteria, but it's not in cr critical after the bacteria started, not as much, because bacteria, the more bacteria you have, the more iron the bacteria uses. So iron's a very critical, very, very critical, and it's been proven that when you feed a tank iron, your plants are going to grow a lot better and colorful with iron. The problem is, like, like you take one of these and and uh, directions, one cap full for 60 gallons uh, once or twice a week is what they're stating on here. So what you do is you make a cap full, you dump it in here, right? Okay, that's that's what it says. Or they make them now with pumps. You, you pump, it tells you how many pumps you're going to need for how many gallons of water. Trouble is, you got all those nutrients in the water column, right? Trouble is, you, you, if you're using carbon, the carbon's going to take it out. Okay, within a matter of a few hours. It'll take a few hours. It could even take as much as 24 hours because the tank's got to constantly circulate. But you're going to lose it. So you put a cap full in there. It did great for a while, but if anything oxidizes, then it becomes useless. So... How do we get to add, I'm, I'm just using this as an example, I'm, you know, I'm not advocating the product, I'm not selling you a product, you, you can use whatever you want, okay, but there's, you've got to think of, how can I 
constantly take this and safely add it to my aquarium every single day. I guess that's what I'm saying. Every single day, you should be adding a little bit of iron and nutrients to your aquarium every single day. Is what's highly recommended. Oh, of course, we see this in saltwater, correct? We see in saltwater aquariums that uh, they use dosing systems. And dosing systems will keep replenishing the aquarium with what it needs. Freshwater aquariums are the same way. They're really no different. You want to get some nutrients in there, but you want to make sure the plants can utilize the nutrients that you're giving it. That's why sometimes if people don't use like CO2, for example, because that's a nutrient that could be missing, uh, they could be overdosing way, way too much. And then they start with all kinds of problems, beard algae, hair algae, and stuff like that, because algae needs very little nutrients to take over your aquarium. So then they end up with trouble. So it's hard for someone to actually tell you and give you a definite answer until you explain to them how are you using your aquarium and are you using CO2. I use CO2 and it lasts for a long time. I've already had that tank of CO2 for six, seven months now because I do not dose my CO2 to try to get up to 30 parts per million. Hey, if it's only seven, eight, nine parts per million, that's good. That's better than what is in the water column if you did not have any CO2. And that keeps it safe. And I know how many bubbles per second to inject into this aquarium. And I'm not going to come up with any problems. I'm not going to come up with damaging my fish or my plants by getting too much CO2 into the aquarium. The plants need a little bit. They need a little bit of, of everything. So I'm going to explain to you what I do, and I'm going to explain to you a little trick that you can use to dose your aquarium. If you don't want to go out there and buy what I have, that's fine. But I'm going to show you how you can do it and stay safe without just pouring a cap full in. And I'm going to ask you, do you know if that cap full is working two, three days from now? Be honest. Do you know that if I put a cap full of that Flourish in here with iron, do you know if it's still in there two or three days from now? Do you have any clue? Of course you don't. You would have to constantly be testing your water and seeing if that Flourish still exists or if any iron exists. But what if Every day you add it a little bit in, safely into your aquarium. Every single day, you're adding your nutrients to your plants to constantly give them their nutrients that they need, where you know that there's not going to be a day that they're going to do without the nutrients. But keep the nutrients at a low enough level. We all learn that with terrestrial plants, right? Uh, if you overdo with fertilizer, what, what happens? You burn your grass out, or if you use a job stick and you put it next to the roots of a tree, uh, that may be too much fertilization for the roots, and it winds up burning the roots, and, and you'll have a bush or a tree or something where half the tree dies because you put one of those job sticks in the ground, and it created too much nitrogen and burnt up the root system. Well, the same thing kind of happens with your aquarium. It's better off to dose small amounts every single day than it is just to put one cap full in once or twice a week and play a guessing game. Am I, am my plants really getting enough of the nutrients? Are they, uh, are they really grown as the way I want? Am I now just catering to the algae? and not to the plant because I put too much in at once. How long is it going to stay in there? Is it available to the plants 24-7? Or is it just available to, to the plants for like 24 or 48 hours? And then by then, if you're using bacteria or if you're using carbon, it's gone. And believe it or not, 
the ADA aquariums and stuff like that, they all dose their nutrient on a constant basis on the uh, mono tanks. Okay, they just don't squirt once or twice a week. They actually have a dosing where they they put it in every single day. Little and if you ever see the his books or, or his aquariums, how beautiful they are. That's because the nutrients are always being brought into the aquarium, but at small amounts. So every day, the plants have a little bit of iron, a little bit of magnesium, a little bit of bit of all their macro and micro nutrients that they need. But the main nutrient that they need, of course, is ammonia. That's what they look for. But to get those other nutrients in there, and it will help them grow and accelerate with trying to keep the algae in control so your tank doesn't get full of all kinds of algae problems and collapse. So we're trying to have a balancing act with what's in here and with what's in here. So we have created in here a huge, a huge mass of bacteria. Just huge mass. And and if you think about it, that's why people, when they have sumps and stuff, they keep adding a brick of this, you know, some porous material. They eat bio balls, they add this, they keep adding this, this. Uh, they have back filters, they keep adding rings. They keep. The reason is they want to build up a big, large colony of bacteria. That's why they keep adding all this stuff to their canister filters. That's why manufacturers with canister filters have designed it to have different trays because they want you not only to clean your water, but they want you to have a separate bacteria colony other than the aquarium itself. Well, in an aquarium like this, when you use a plenum and stuff, you are actually creating a very, very massive bacteria colony in here. So we know that the canister filter is using a BCB, and right now, the aquarium water, after three months, uh, I do about, I add 10 gallons of water out of this 90 gallon once a week with like a, a siphon, okay, you, that you hook up to your sink. Not a big problem. I just take it down so far, refill it with new water. I really don't touch the substrate because the fish waste and all, it's being sucked down in here and being utilized. And I can see right now, since I'm talking to you, I see another root system coming up here. I don't know what it's to. It could be to the plant, but I see a root starting to come right out of the substrate here. And it looks like, to me, it does look like a plant. I'll look at it a little bit better, but I see that this is something new that I see coming up here. That could even be from here, the Anubias, but here. And when you get your water column to mix with this and have that large bacteria colony, you don't have to keep worrying about, oh, if I got my canister all full of, uh, you know, noodles or whatever you're going to use, because this one... Because of the BCB in there, you don't clean the BCB. I, you just pull it out. And what I did is I just took the sponge, cleaned out the sponge. But any of the other stuff, the filter flosses and stuff I'm using, uh, I throw that away. I don't even clean it. I just throw it away, put new in. You don't have to worry about, oh, if I clean this, am I going to have a bacteria jump in my aquarium? No, you're not. Because you have plenty in here. So you're not going to have a ammonia spike or anything else. Plus the fact the BCB itself didn't need to be clean. And the uh, BCB in that big canister filter, like I said, is about the size of a 2217 Eheim filter. So it's a pretty good size round basket that's in there. So I put you know, all my substrate in there. It was dirty. I'll admit that. It, after over three months of not being clean, it was dirty. So I figured, well, about every three months, I should pull the canister out, clean it. Hey, I can do that all day. I can do that all day. If I if I only have to touch my canister once every 90 days, every three months, 
that that's not a problem. I, I can because it still is balanced, and that's what you want. You want a balanced aquarium because people keep saying that. Well, you have to keep your aquarium real clean and crystal clear and clean, and 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 you should try to get the dirt that's in here out of here. That's all true. That's all true. I'm, I'm going to admit that. That's all very true. But, but in the same term, okay, I change water, put fresh water in, which will add nutrients and stuff like that and calcium and stuff like that. But you also have to have this balance. And once this becomes balanced, once your substrate becomes balanced, then you're pretty well on easy street for years and years to come before you would really have to think about getting the gravel back and actually vacuum up that gravel and the waste. You don't want to overfeed, of course. You know, with food, you understand that. But as far as the fish waste is concerned, let it fall down here and let the bacteria break it down into mum, which is inert. Okay, once all that waste gets broken down into mum, it's inert. It's not going to hurt anything. It's, it's not going to take away or add to the aquarium. In fact, it's just going to make more for your bacteria colony to grow on. But that's what we're looking for, that balancing act that normally doesn't happen when you just take a substrate, maybe add an inch to the bottom. Okay, you, that balancing act, sometimes it works. Mm, as we all know, sometimes it doesn't work. For me, I could set up four aquariums that way, and just me, I'm just talking about me, I will probably fail three out of the four times with that aquarium. Within a year, I'll have to be think, rethinking about tearing down the aquarium because it, it, it won't come out right. And I've done it enough. I've been in this hobby for over 60 years. I've done it enough to, to see that's what's happened, and therefore I don't do it. Even in the smallest little fish bowls that I've ever made, I always put a little filter in there, even if it's not bubbling, just to get the stones off the bottom so we know that nutrients and everything can, can pass through the substrate easier. I've always done that. Uh, I'll give you an example here, in fact. See this little guy here? This is a bed aquarium. But that gravel is not sitting on the bottom of here. It's not. There's a little bitty, like a, a mesh in here, a screen mesh that I bought at the hardware store that you put in sinks. I put that down first and put the gravel on top of it. That way the gravel is not sitting at the bottom of here. And so as a bed aquarium, you still have a plenum. So even in the smallest of containers, I've always made a plenum, and I've always had great success with using a plenum, whether it be uh, just even a beta bowl. Uh, so what I'm going to do is explain to you, there, there's several ways of, of doing it. And I'm going to show you one very quick way that if you have nutrients, instead of taking and squirting the nutrient into the aquarium or using a cap full that says once a week, maybe twice a week, what I do is I take a bottle like this. You don't need, this is just a hydrogen peroxide bottle, okay, uh, empty. Uh, you can buy these empty. You don't need to buy a hydroperoxide, but if you buy a bottle like this, you could use a bottle like this once it's empty with hydroperoxide. And what you do is you put, fill it full of water, and you can buy these at any hardware store, you can buy them at Walmart, you can buy them uh, uh, anywhere. Empty bottles. And what I do is I take something like this, I put water in it, but I also put what I'm going to put for nutrients into the aquarium. So let's say if it says a cap full, okay, I'll put a cap full of what I need or two cap fulls in here. And then if you have some 
Excel, you put a cap full in there. Uh, whatever you're going to use, you put it in the bottle and dilute it. Get what I'm saying? So you put the capsules and then you fill it up full of water. Okay. Then what you do, and this is real simple, what you do is whenever you feed your fish, you go up to the tank and squirt it in. That's it. Every day. You feed your fish every day. It's not really a big hassle. You feed your fish, squirt a little bit of your homemade stuff that's been diluted in here. Squirt it in your tank every day. Okay? You're not squirting it in a capful and it's all diluted. So you're getting a little bit of your fertilizers into the tank every single day. So if it does oxidize or if the carbon does take it out, you have replenished it for the next day. Now that is the simplest way that I've always done it if I don't have a dosing system. And I'm going to show you my dosing system that I use, but I've always done that where I've taken just a little squirt bottle like that and diluted it and squirt it in there. So every day you're adding iron to your aquarium, just a little bit. Just one squirt, it's all it takes. Okay? And maybe if you had a, uh, um, a six-foot long tank, okay, something at uh, 150 gallon, you would have to determine how your plants are growing, whether or not one squirt would be enough. Well, fine. If you feed your fish twice a day, one squirt in the morning, one squirt in the evening. It's not a big hassle. You're feeding your fish anyhow. Just grab the bottle, squirt it. Okay, you're done. That's it. You added your nutrients for the day. Next day, you do the same thing. Grab the bottle, just squirt it. Boom. That's it. Don't overdo it. Don't think more is better. In this case, a little bit goes a long, long way. Just to add a little bit of iron in there. Because iron really, if it's even down to point one part per million, that's more than enough. Okay? You don't need it higher than even that. Iron does not have to be any higher than 0.1 part per million. That's that's quite almost nothingness of iron and manganese and magnesium and stuff. It takes very little. So all you're doing is adding very little into the aquarium on a constant basis every single day. And you have to make it convenient. So I found that the best thing to do is get a squirt bottle. Just one squirt, you're done. Okay, if you have aggressive growing plants, maybe once in the morning, once in the afternoon, maybe. That's going to have to be determined by you, your lighting system, how much CO2 you would be injecting, what kind of plants you have. All that determines on if you would use two squirts per day. But at least doing that every single day, those nutrients that you just put in there, can be used up or oxidized or let them do what they want, and then you can replenish them the next day because those are going to become old. Then just putting a cap full in and guessing that three, four days from now, do I add another cap full in? Uh, uh, and as you notice, they don't want you putting much of that into your aquarium. Did you notice that? At one cap full for 60 gallons of water, maybe once or twice a week, did you notice how little they, uh, fertilizer they want you to put into your aquarium, what they recommend? Because the manufacturers aren't stupid. They know that if you over-fertilize it, you're going to come up with all kinds of problems. So this is one way to assure yourself that you put a cat full of your fertilizer inside something like that, or two, if you're going to use two, and then whatever other things you're going to use, your potassium, pour a little bit of that in there, and you squirt it in by diluting it, and you're going to come up with better plant growth and less growth on your algae side. Because now your higher order plants will be able to utilize what you're putting in there because there's going to be trace amounts in there. Unless you're going to try to get a scientific, you know, lab equipment that determine where everything's at or constantly test. So I'm going to show you what I use 
to do basically the same thing as a squirt bottle in my aquarium. And maybe you can utilize that.